1915 to 1930, the population of the United States rose up to help Armenians. Your great-grandparents were most likely housed in an orphanage that was run by Near East Relief. Near East Relief, which is the forerunner to the Near East Foundation, is the institution most responsible for the preservation of the Armenian people after the genocide of 1915. The, the United States and Americans had had a long-standing relationship with the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire, uh, dating really from the period of the 1890s when the American Red Cross had been part of relief efforts after the Hamadian massacres in which several hundred thousand Armenians were killed by the forces of Abdul Hamid II, which was really a sort of a dress rehearsal for the genocide of 1915. The deportations and the atrocities began as early as April of 1915, and by June, reports were making its way onto Morgenthau's desk, and at that point he quickly dispatched telegrams to the State Department asking for relief assistance. And by September of 1915, he called upon Cleveland Dodge, James Barton, and others to form a committee, which eventually became the American Committee for uh, Armenian and Syrian Relief. Later, it changed its name to the American Committee for Relief in the Near East. And then finally, in 1919, through an act of Congress, it was called the Near East Relief. Henry Morgenthau was in Turkey, Ambassador Morgenthau was in Turkey, and uh, sent a cable uh, to the States, which then was relayed uh, to Cleveland H. Dodge, uh, asking uh, for a convening of a group of uh, philanthropists uh, who could come together to respond uh, immediately to uh, the growing crisis from Turkey. He uh, rose to the challenge and uh, convened the first meeting in his offices uh, here in New York uh, of the Near East Relief. To those who went through the genocide and their families, uh, they are all too familiar with just what a vital role that the Near East Relief Agency played uh, in their very survival. Uh, and certainly the generation that came after, I think, was very well aware of the story of Near East Relief. Uh, since that generation, much has been forgotten uh, by the American people uh, as, as a whole. Uh, it's a, a remarkable story. This agency set out to raise, I think, about $100,000 at the time, which was an astronomical sum, ended up raising over $117 million, which is close to $2 billion in today's dollar terms. Uh, so the outpouring was extraordinary uh, from all over the world, but certainly here in America, where it became a real cause celeb, uh, literally cause celeb, and that many celebrities got involved. But it was mostly ordinary Americans who were moved by the plight of the Armenian people. The initial $100,000 came from the founders of the Near East Relief. These were businessmen, philanthropists, educators, and they raised that money which was initially sent to Ambassador Morgenthau and handed out as relief. Morgenthau was there through most, much of the, the first period of the genocide. And something which I think should be well understood is that American uh, diplomats, the Rockefeller War Relief Board, uh, missionaries and others, despite attempts by the Ottoman government to cover up what was happening, were very aware of how devastating um, efforts were and how successful Ottoman efforts were at destroying the Armenians as a people. I mean, we have in the Rockefeller archives maps showing the routes of deportation from 1915-1916. I mean, it was very, very clear 
that the Ottoman state was trying to exterminate the Armenians as a people. And Morgenthau just was outraged by this, especially because the Ottoman state had made so many international promises that it was going to protect the Armenians and give them a level of autonomy and so on. And so I think Morgenthau was outraged, and rightly so, that there was a, a murder of a nation was taking place. He saw a, a terrible wrong being done, the murder of a, a whole nation, really, the Armenian people. And he spoke out. And, and, it, it took courage because there were no other prominent people speaking in, in government positions speaking out about the murder of the Armenians. Morgenthau wanted to help the Armenians because he understood what was happening to them was unjust and was, un, and was wrong. Um, and I think that underlies much of the reason why Americans were so dedicated to trying to help the Armenians because they saw their cause as just and they believed what was happening to them was unfair. He was one of the founding fathers of the Near East Relief Fund to, to help the uh, survivors of the genocide, the Armenian genocide. But, I mean, he, he recognized that, I mean, this was action by a, a government against its citizens. And uh, he took it extremely seriously. And uh, he spoke out, you know, he, I think that he wrote a book, The, the Murder of a Nation, you know, and, and uh, it was a very important act by him, and as I say, it was not that much appreciated by the United States State Department. And so he came back to the United States and to raise money publicly through the Near East Relief Fund, and, you know, he spoke at dinners all over for the next four years, really. Near East Relief really embodied some of the best things about the American presence in, in the Middle East. You know, these were, these, many of the Near East Relief officials were young men and young women who had just lived through the First World War. Some were even veterans of the First World War. And when they traveled to, to the region, they became deeply intertwined in the lives of the people they had come to help. And, you know, the, the, I think that the story of someone like Stanley Kerr is really emblematic of the role that Near East Relief played in the lives of Armenians and in protecting Armenians from the situation, the, the very bloody and very awful situation which followed the attempts to restore the Armenian community in southern Anatolia. So Kerr had gone to Marash as a young man in his 20s uh, to help administer the uh, Near East Relief's hospitals and rehabilitation centers there. But as Marash was plunged into civil war, as um, the Kemalists sought to expel the French, Armenians were drawn into a terrible, terrible local civil war that ultimately cost over 20,000 Armenian lives. But throughout that entire period, Kerr didn't leave. At any moment, he could have just walked away, but instead he stayed in Marash, stood with the Armenians, and helped protect those who could not flee, especially old people and orphans, and continued to be an advocate for Armenians for the rest of his life. Many of the Near East relief workers and missionaries took great personal risk to help the refugees. Several of them uh, contracted typhus as a result of helping the orphan children. About 30 of them died during their service to the Near East Relief. Lester Wright was one of the first volunteers to die a violent death. In October of 1922, while traveling with a convoy of orphans from Harput to Aleppo, he and his colleague Enoch Applegate were attacked by Kurdish bandits. Um, Mr. Wright was shot and he died instantly and Applegate was also shot and wounded, but he survived. Mm -hmm. 
one of the um, heart-wrenching things that happened, and I heard the story from the Armenian who survived it, was the story of a boy who lost his entire family. Uh, when I grew up in Anaheim as a student, he was still alive. And he told me that story. But that is one of hundreds of thousands of stories of Armenian Americans who survived like him, without any family. The only reason he survived was Near East Relief, was the fact that he alone made it out of his village and someone was there to feed him, to educate him, to care for him. And the reason that he did survive was because Americans and others came up with the equivalent of two billion dollars in today's dollars in order to try to make certain that the Armenian people did not, were not annihilated. The goal of the genocide was to annihilate a whole race. Probably all great endeavors with a very small group of people uh, who were moved themselves uh, and decided to do something about it and probably never imagined that it would be uh, as successful and it would grow the way it did. Uh, but thank goodness that it did. Uh, it really, uh, when you look at the map of the world and where the resources came from to support the Armenian people, it came from every nation on the globe. It was just extraordinary. And I think one of the most moving images of the time uh, is an image taken, I believe, from a rooftop of uh, many thousands of Armenian orphans who are spelling out the words, thank you to America. Uh, for their continued existence, for their rescue, for their salvation. Uh, and you know, looking at those photos gives you a great sense of pride. You also get a sense of the deep American commitment and involvement uh, in some of the graphics of the day and some of the posters uh, that uh, populated uh, post offices on the workplaces that showed Uncle Sam uh, you know, clutching an Armenian orphan or an Armenian orphan clutching Lady Liberty very powerful images that were reflective of the time and were reflective of the degree to which the Ar plight of the Armenians really touched the American people. The modern Armenian post-genocide community was shaped by its interaction with Near East Relief. The emphasis on education, the recovery of the Armenian language, the fact that when the Americans came they didn't come as, as missionaries but rather as helpers and didn't ask Armenians to abandon the Armenian church. All of these things are absolutely critical. And what is the Armenian community today is in, is in part built by this relationship between Near East Relief and the Armenians who survived the genocide. My maternal grandfather, Hagop, was born in Severek, Turkey in 1912. During the Armenian genocide, his father was killed and he was separated from his mother and his siblings on the forced deportation marches. Hagop was the sole survivor of his family. In the chaos of the deportations, Hagop's Kurdish neighbors took him in and sought him to raise his as their own. They taught Hagop Kurdish and gave him a Kurdish name, Seda. During these years, Hagop learned Kurdish fluently and was given the responsibility to tend to the family's pastures and to herd their sheep, working alongside the family's children. Hagop was among the 8,000 orphans the Swiss missionaries Jacob Kunzler and his wife Elizabeth transported to safety during what is known as the Great Orphan Migration, which began in the spring of 1922. Hagop spent some time in Ghazir Orphanage and eventually settled in the Antilias Orphanage until April 1928 when he was discharged. There he learned the trade of carpentry and he was among the orphans who built wooden tricycles and toys for the younger Armenian orphans, also under the care of the missionaries and nearest relief. Later, my grandfather would continue to make replicas of these same toys for his own children and grandchildren. My grandfather never left Lebanon after the trek he made with the other orphans. Were it not for the efforts of the missionaries under the nearest relief, who were scouring the area for Armenian orphans who might have been left behind, Hagop would have been forced to assume his Kurdish identity. I'm 
mother came in 1920 uh, after the massacres. She was in an orphanage and she was found there by a relative and brought here. My mother started working in New York at a uh, uh, carpet store and uh, she learned carpet uh, weaving at the orphanage in uh, Turkey. And she learned there, it was a large orphanage. A lot of Armenian children were brought there. And uh, that's what I learned. I had learned about the massacres through the AYF. Uh, later on, we moved to California. And my daughter, Nora, found out that uh, two Turks were shot in Santa Barbara by an Armenian for revenge. And uh, Mom opened up. She'd never opened up to me. She was thankful. <laughs> it's a very sad story. What we are mean is a bit toward. When I was 10 years old in 1973, uh, news broke that Gurgen Yanakyan had assassinated two Turkish diplomats in Santa Barbara, California. And at that time, we lived in Detroit, and my grandparents uh, were visiting from Syracuse, New York. And Grandma opened up to Nora and told the story about her being pushed into the Euphrates River and how she uh, was saved. And my grandmother sat me down, just the two of us, and she told me that she needs to tell me something very important. So she went through this story that was just unbelievable to me. She told me that when she was a little girl like I was, back in Yerzinga, Turkey or Western Armenia. Uh, she was one of seven children and she had two older brothers who had already come to the United States previous to the war uh, to study. And during the war, uh, she said that her father and uncle and all the men of her family were axed to death by Turkish soldiers in front of her eyes. Her mother and her aunt took all of the children, including her, and they all lined up at the banks of the Euphrates River, held hands, uh, said a prayer, and then jumped into the river to drown themselves because they didn't want to be taken away by the Turkish soldiers. So her whole family drowned around her, and she saw a weeping willow tree at the edge of the river and there was a branch overhanging and she grabbed onto that weeping willow tree branch and was saved from drowning. And she stayed there for a while until a Kurdish family came and rescued her and took her to their home. And they kept her there for a while and she helped cleaning and cooking and taking care of their children. Until one day, American missionaries were going through Yerzinga they turned her over to the American missionaries, and she was taken to an American orphanage, which it turns out was a Near East Relief orphanage. So she stayed in the orphanage for a while, and she said that she learned how to weave uh, oriental rugs in the orphanage. And a couple of years later, 
Uh, her brother, who had been in New York at the time, was apparently frantically searching through the U.S. government for any survivors of his family. And through the orphanage, he found her. She came to the United States um, on a ship, and landed at Ellis Island, and joined her brother in New York. She was sobbing as she was telling me. Uh, she said that's the first time she's spoken of it, but she felt that she had to tell me as her oldest grandchild that she had to pass this legacy on to me. It kind of became my life's mission to tell her story um, because even at that young age, I felt like there was a huge burden placed on my shoulders to um, seek justice for an unpunished crime against my family as well as against my people. And as a result of that, I became very active. Of course, my parents instilled the same feelings in me as well. Um, and the weird thing was that she had never told my father, her only son, her story. She said that she wanted to spare him the pain as he was growing up. So she never told him the story and he heard it from me for the first time. As a result of that, I just became very active in Armenian organizations until uh, I reached the point where I found the Armenian National Committee of America to be the most effective organization to pursue justice for the Armenian cause. And I'm fortunate enough now to serve as the chair of the Western Region. And in that capacity of um, helping to lead this grassroots organization, we decided to pay tribute to the Near East Relief, which was the American organization back during the genocide and in the years following the genocide, which was responsible for rescuing my grandmother, uh, as well as countless other orphans. Um, Near East Relief actually saved 132,000 Armenian orphans during the years 1915 to 1930. And we put together a committee, which we entitled the America We Thank You Committee. It's an Armenian tribute to Near East Relief. And many members of our own committee also have grandparents that were saved through the Near East Relief orphanages. So this is our way to pay tribute to those orphanages and to all those missionaries and other volunteers who traveled across the world from America all the way to Western Armenia and the Ottoman Empire to save those helpless orphans who had lost their parents in the genocide. It is truly an honor to stand before you today, along with our president, Dr. Charlie Benjamin, and Vice Chairman John Z. Garrett, to accept this award on behalf of the Near East Foundation, the bearer of the Near East Relief's legacy. For most, the story of the Near East Relief is largely unknown. But thanks to the ANCA and many dedicated individuals and historians around the world, that is about to change. We are pleased to have partnered with the ANCA's Western Region's America We Thank You initiative to raise awareness about this lost chapter in American history. The work of the Near East Relief is a reflection of the strong bonds between the American and Armenian people. So the, the honors by uh, Armenian groups such, such as ANCA have been uh, uh, a wonderful tribute to uh, Cleveland H. Dodge, certainly, but also to the organization and the great impact that it had on so many lives. I, I was very proud to receive that award, and, and one of the great things about uh, Armenian people is that they got good memories and they don't forget their friends. Armenian Americans. Uh, have been scientists, they've been artists, they've been doctors, uh, virtually in every category of endeavor. Medicine, the science, arts, literature, law, in every field of endeavor, the Armenian community has not only enriched the country, but provided some of the most superb talent. They have given back a great deal to this country. I have also noticed their work in philanthropy.
not just in Armenia, uh, but also in, in many, many ways, in many, many causes. Uh, so we've been tremendously enriched by the presence of a vibrant Armenian community. Uh, and it's no uh, exaggeration to say that America would not be what it is uh, without the contributions of the Amer Armenian community. I think that America owes a debt of gratitude to the contribution of Armenian Americans. And I think America also has a responsibility to tell the story, as Ronald Reagan told it, of the genocide. And I think it's important that the Armenian American community continue uh, its quest to have justice done. It's a deep and tragic irony that uh, a country like the United States that played such a prominent role in providing relief to the survivors of the genocide, uh, that played such an important role in calling attention to the genocide. And Ambassador Morgenthau was one of the preeminent voices of his day in calling the attention of, of the world to what was happening to the, to the Armenians uh, in cables. The, the term genocide at the time had not been coined yet. That would only later be coined by a Holocaust survivor named uh, Raphael Lemkin, whose uh, entire family was wiped out. Forty members of his family were killed in the Holocaust. And he looked for a word that would describe the crime of trying to annihilate a people. And when he coined that term genocide, he pointed to the Armenian example. It's a serious, serious fault that we don't recognize now the Armenian genocide and the you know, the Congress has repeatedly refused to, to enact a resolution condemning the, the Turkey for the genocide. It's a serious problem. I think the role the United States should play is to speak out forcefully about the Armenian genocide. I think another role is to also make certain that we defend and protect Armenia. It's a terrible irony that uh, the, the example that gave root to that word genocide, along with the Holocaust, uh, the country that was most responsible for summoning the conscience of the world in the relief effort, um, the country which had the ambassador in the region who called out most, most loudly the crime that was going on, uh, should continue uh, to be complicit in this uh, Turkish campaign of denial. It's a, it's a, tragic and bitter irony, uh, and one that I desperately hope we put an end to right away. Mm -hmm.